Thank you uh, very much for coming. And the first area that we're going to be looking at is leadership and sexual uh, integrity. Let me just read some verses from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses uh, 3 to 8. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that's holy and honourable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you're the living God, and thank you that you want us to be sexually pure uh, and obedient to you. Please would you speak to us from your word now and help us to uh, understand how we can practice uh, sexual integrity in our ministries and in leadership. In Jesus' name, amen. I've been a Christian for uh, 30 years and in leadership for 25 years. And over that period of time, I've seen many Christian leaders and church pastors fall into sexual sin and their ministries have been ruined, their lives have been damaged, the reputation of the gospel has been brought into disrepute. Even in this last year, a very high profile minister in Britain was found to be having relationships with a number of members of his congregation and tragically he committed suicide. Um, uh, but that's just one of many cases of sexual failure in ministry. And I'm sure all of us will know people who have fallen into sexual sin and their ministries have been ruined. So it's hugely important that we think about the area of sexual integrity for ministry. The Bible is full of warnings of the dangers of sexual temptation and sexual sin. Lots of examples of Bible characters who fell into sexual sin. Think, for example, of Judah in the uh, book of Genesis, who slept with his daughter-in-law, Tamar, who was dressed as a prostitute. Think of Israel in the wilderness, who was seduced by the Baal of Peor to uh, sexual immorality. Think, of course, of David, who committed adultery with Bathsheba. Or of Amnon, who uh, uh, raped his sister Tamar because of his desire for her. The New Testament, every New Testament letter just about, refers to the danger of sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians speaks of a member of the congregation who's sleeping with his father's wife and of Christians who go and use the shrine prostitutes in the temple. So the Bible is full of warnings against sexual immorality, and it warns uh, leaders against uh, sexual immorality. Of course, we have to remember what the biblical standard of sexual integrity is. Uh, the uh, Bible tells us that God, sex itself is a good thing, which was created by God to be enjoyed, but only in marriage between a man and a woman. So the biblical standard for sexual integrity is that sex uh, is only appropriate in the context of marriage. Therefore, the Bible tells us that sexual desires um, uh, that come from our heart, that are not for um, our, our wife, those lusts, are evil desires. Mark chapter 7. The Bible warns us against sexual immorality uh, in the Greek porneai, which means any kind of sex outside of marriage. Sex with somebody we're not married to, adultery, prostitution, homosexuality. The Bible warns us against lust. Jesus said to look at a woman lustfully. That's um, uh, sort of sexually desiring and wanting and fantasizing about a woman that you're not married to is, is the same as adultery. It's committing adultery in the heart. We're told as Christian leaders we're to be faithful uh, in marriage. 1 Timothy 3 says that a church leader should be um, a one-woman man, basically committed to the one uh, woman he's married to. In singleness... The Bible says those who are not married are called to be celibate. Um, 
Uh, and the Bible warns against the dangers of uh, uh, sort of uh, same-sex relationships and um, homosexual desires that are equally sinful. The Bible sets a higher standard for those who are in ministry. They are expected to set an example of uh, greater maturity. And that ought to be evident in um, uh, their sexual um, area of their lives as well. So uh, as we've mentioned, 1 Timothy chapter 3, speaking of the qualities needed for church leaders, says that they must set the highest standards by being um, a, a one-woman man. That means they're to be committed to their wife. They're not to be known to be somebody who is chasing after all sorts of other women, desiring uh, other women. They're to be demonstrating and modeling faithful commitment in marriage. Well, Christian leaders I know have fallen into um, all sorts of sexual uh, sins and failures. I know Christian leaders and church leaders who formed emotional attachments with people they're not married to. It, it might not have become sexual, but it's an inappropriate relationship. Uh, there are those who um, have fallen into pornography, an increasingly common problem for uh, many Christian leaders and uh, especially male, younger uh, Christian leaders. Pornography is sexual sin. Um, there, there are Christian leaders who've uh, engaged in prostitution, who've paid for sex, sometimes with female prostitutes and sometimes with male prostitutes. There are church leaders who engage in casual sex, who use dating apps to find people to have sex with. There are Christian leaders who've engaged in, in affairs with members of the, uh, their congregations, with other ministry staff, maybe with uh, people who are not Christians at all. Those who've left their wives, uh, whether for another woman or in some situations uh, for another man. Christian leaders fall into all of those temptations. They are dangers that we need to guard against. But why are Christian leaders especially susceptible to sexual sin? I think there are some particular pressures of Christian leadership. Well, firstly, Christian leaders, like all human beings, continue to have a fallen flesh. So it's not surprising that we experience sexual desires and that we face sexual temptations. We're involved uh, in a struggle between the spirit and the flesh with its fallen desires. We're involved in a spiritual battle. Romans chapter seven and Romans eight describe that. So does Galatians chapter five. Ephesians six talks about the uh, spiritual battle we're engaged in. Satan wants to discredit the gospel and one of the best ways to discredit the gospel is to tempt Christian leaders into sexual sin. Because when Christian leaders sin, the world um, uh, sees it as hypocrisy and, and, and the world concludes the gospel can't be true. But there are also unique temptations that go with the job of Christian ministry. Um, people commit sexual sin and fall into sexual sin for different reasons. For some people, it's abusing the power that they have in ministry. For others, it's because of the loneliness and pressures of ministry, different reasons. So for some, uh, uh, ministry brings opportunities for sexual immorality. Those in Christian leadership often enjoy power and authority over others. There are people who find Christian leaders attractive because of their power and status. So uh, younger women in a congregation or, or other people in a congregation, they might find the, the pastor or the church leader attractive because he has that status. And the leader might want to exploit that. He might actually not be that attractive, but his job makes him more attractive to others. And it opens up an opportunity. Uh, Christian leaders are often engaging with very vulnerable people who are needy, particularly if they um, are counselling and caring for people of the opposite sex. Although we mustn't forget as well, some people 
are tempted by same-sex attraction. So for them, it's difficult if they're counselling somebody of the same sex. But they come into contact with needy and vulnerable people and they can exploit them and use them. Um, ministry might bring real closeness with co-workers. In ministry, you might be working very closely with somebody and develop a, a close friendship and partnership. You might feel closer to that person than to your wife or husband. And that leads you into um, sexual immorality. Sometimes it's abuse of power and opportunity. Sometimes it's a result of neediness. Ministry is lonely. And so people look for sexual comfort. Many Christian leaders are pouring themselves out for others. And so they look for quick comfort. That's why they look to prostitution or why they look to affairs. Because they feel emotionally empty and exhausted. And they see sex or pornography as a release from some of that pressure of ministry. Ministry can be difficult in creating pressures at home. Marriages may well be frustrating because uh, so much time is given to ministry and the result is that there's an attraction to sex outside of marriage to bring satisfaction. For those reasons, Christian leaders can be particularly susceptible to sexual sin. And temptation is different at different ages. We need to recognise that we face different temptations at different ages. So a young Christian leader who's not married will face certain kinds of temptations because they don't have a sexual relationship. As Paul might say in 1 Corinthians 6, better to marry than to burn. But a, a young single Christian leader will face temptations because they're not married. Somebody who is married and has children may begin to face temptations because so much of their wife's time and their time is taken up looking after children. Their marriage is not the same as it was when they were first married. And they become frustrated because of all of the demands of life. Somebody who's uh, middle-aged and getting older, they may face temptations of attraction to younger people because they're suddenly fearing being old and they look for a new relationship with somebody younger to make them feel better about themselves. So there are different temptations that come at different stages of ministry and we need to understand that so that we are on guard against the danger.